down. Because your stage is one big wrestling chamber. Yeah. The best way to start a talk is just to have everything fall apart right at the beginning. Right? Yeah. Get all that out of the way. Well, hello all. Welcome. Yeah, as Harlan was saying, uh, I think this might be my sixth or seventh presentation here at the bookstore. Most of these lectures have gone viral. I uh, put them out on freemantv.com if you want to catch up on any thought I've ever had. Uh, it's all there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so the last time I was here, we spoke on Obama cloning and becoming space war. And I blew a few minds with this talk. But you know what? I didn't honestly have all the evidence necessary to really say what I meant to say. Now I do. All right. The story has not stopped, <laughs> as many of my stories do. Uh, they carry forward and continue to amaze even me. So let's open, because this talk is uh, basically based on ET and the transhumanist agenda. And it's going to get into social programming, uh, cloning, and uh, some stuff that you're going to find just totally bizarre. But I wanted to open this uh, with a little word from our former master, uh, Bill Clinton. So, there is much about cloning that we still do not know, but this much we do. Any discovery that touches upon human creation is not simply a matter of scientific inquiry. It is a matter of morality and spirituality as well. I believe we must respect this profound gift and resist the temptation to replicate ourselves. Shortly after Dolly's birth was announced, President Clinton took steps towards banning human cloning experiments in the United States. The Bioethics Commission he established called upon Rabbi Dorf, along with several other members of the religious and scientific community, to address the ethics of human cloning. The commission recommended that cloning be banned, at least temporarily. Um, while further study is, uh, is done as to exactly what it would involve and what the risks are. Eight years to Other world, world leaders Australia took similar action. action. The reaction against the prospect of cloning the the world wide on this Sunday address that they applied such experiments were dangerous. Today it is banned cloning experiments. So did Argentina. And the German government said there should be a worldwide ban on cloning. I don't think government bans will indeed stop it. First of all, because you'd have to have an international ban on cloning in order to do that. And even if you had an international ban, there's no guarantee whatsoever that it won't happen in some lab somewhere. Technology, once it's developed, does not go away. It may go underground if sufficiently persecuted. The uh, human cloning is not going away. And already we have many legislative uh, bodies coming together discussing the human cloning problem. Now, of course, as they were saying, and there's a lot of reasons that human cloning could be a huge problem, in that we could start generating humans for certain jobs or certain work. And uh, the whole idea of the, the need of life. <laughs> you know, and, and the, the sanctity of, of human life. You're not supposed to be watching all this behind the camera here, but... Uh, <laughs> not soon, I think. All right. <laughs> the, uh, the sanctity of human life, it comes a full board in question if we start talking about cloning humans and then what's going to happen with those cloned humans. Are they citizens? Are they people? Uh, the, the, the methods of human cloning have been around since Dolly was created. And the first clone to be cloned was actually split by a baby hair. Uh, this is how the techniques came about. As they cloned frogs and other amphibians, they would use, a, well, the first doctor to do this actually used a baby hair off his baby's head and, and split the cell. But the curious thing about human cloning or cloning in general is that it requires an electrical shock to the cell to, to make it alive. So now we got this question, is it actually alive? What, what is that life force, that life spark that was given to this cell to make it grow? Uh, and as they said, many people are going on and uh, continuing with human cloning behind the scenes, such as Dr. Zavos, who actually spoke before Congress about cloning humans with another strange character known as Ra-El. 
I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ra'el, but he's been an object of my talks for a long time. Uh, this is a guy who claimed to meet Yahweh in a flying saucer. And he told him to begin these cloning techniques in a new embassy in Israel for the Elohim's return. Which of course has a flying saucer shaped swimming pool, I don't know. But the symbol that uh, Ra'el wore to Congress and wants to put on this temple to the extraterrestrial gods in Israel is the Star of David interwoven with a swastika. Hmm. And of course, this caused a lot of strife. Uh, but Dr. Zavos showed up with Ryle to, to say that human cloning was not going to go away. And I wasn't going to show you this. In the eerie blue been, light uh, of his world. secret lab, one of the world's most controversial scientists shows off his creation, cloned human embryos that are genetic carbon copies of their father. Oh, my babies are doing well. They look beautiful. Filmed for a TV documentary, Dr. Paniotis Zavos implants 11 of the embryos in four women, one of them British, in the hope of producing the first cloned human being. Now the reason he can get away with this is that he is working in Saudi Arabia, where the uh, cloning is not, uh, the legislation on cloning is not as stringent, and he can get away with cloning humans at this point. So. As I came before you before, uh, we were talking about Obama cloning in the coming space war. I wonder how many of you were here? Just a few. Okay, so let's review. Uh, now, I had brought this topic up in, in the hopes that it would gain some more national attention thanks to uh, the fact that Barack Obama came out discussing human cloning, uh, but no one seemed to notice. It is in my new film, E.T. and the Transhumanist Agenda, I do have uh, Barack Obama's speech on human cloning and how he found it profoundly wrong and dangerous, as many should, but perhaps <laughs> he might just be a clone himself. Now, as strange as this may seem to you, this is a singular Egyptian family. It is the family of Akhenaten. This is Akhenaten who turned Egypt on its head, turned, uh, took the capital of Egypt, put it in Thebes, took it from Thebes and moved it to his own capital in Armana, got rid of the, mono, or the, the many gods and brought the first monotheistic religion, the worship of the Aten. And so he was known as the renegade pharaoh because he was then placed, uh, he, he turned Egypt on its head. But now the, the Freemasonic orders, the, the secret societies, revere this man. They, they call him the first individual. They call him the first Democrat. And it's because Akhenaten seemed to be a very real pharaoh, one that, that showed himself, depicted himself with his family, with everyone else, and, and brought about the most realistic artwork Egypt had ever known. But he was pretty much overshadowed by his mother which was Queen T. And she had ruled since uh, being four years old, actually, and through a couple of pharaohs, uh, her husband, and then uh, the child of Akhenaten, finally followed by King Tut. Uh, she basically had all the power. The, the pharaohs themselves were too young. Queen T ran the show. Akhenaten produced two children with Nefertiti, his wife. And the two children, <laughs> are actually identical to Malay and Sasha. So I had put together the idea that it's quite possible, I keep trying to use the scroll button, uh, it's quite possible that these people actually are clones of these ancient pharaohs. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm <coughs> changing the list, <laughs> jumping back going back. So, I, let's go ahead and just let this. So now the Secret Service gave the, uh, the Obamas uh, code names. And these code names actually fit perfectly with Akhenaten and his family. Now, I want you to know that I did not manipulate this photograph at all. I took the Time cover magazine of Barack Obama and I put it with Akhenaten's bust. I took the bust of Queen T, and, and that's Michelle Obama's high school photo. I took a bust of Marita Ten, and that is Malaya. 
Now you'll see that each of the code names that they are given actually fit the whole story as well. Renegade, Renaissance, Radiance, and Rosebud are the names of the family. Now first of all, if we're going to call our president Renegade, this is what it means. Someone who rebels and becomes an outlaw. A disloyal person who betrays and deserts his cause or religion or the political party or friends, etc. So this is the title they've given to Barack Obama in the Secret Service. Now, you might wonder, can they actually clone a mummy? And in 1984... Sorry, my screen, I can't see. 1984, they came out a New York Times article showing that intact genetic material was taken from a mummy and cloned. Now, this is not to say they rebuilt the mummy, or brought the mummy back to life. They cloned cells. But the, the important part of the story was that mummification, uh, a process that we still know nothing about, Lenin, Stalin are rotting in their mummy wraps. We don't know how to mummy like the Egyptians did. And mummification saves a viable cell for human cloning. These guys can come back. And they have. So. <laughs> so we have new ideas, new thoughts and theories as new TV shows come to play. Uh, I cloned my pet is the latest one, and I don't know if any of you have seen this, but now we're cloning animals, right? You're cloning your pets, bringing them back. Kind of getting this back into the stream of consciousness and allowing people to man, gather uh, an idea of what human cloning could be. And now we're doing it first with pets, and of course it'll, it'll progress. It'll come forward and start to go towards humans more and more. But when I left the talk, uh, in Obama cloning in the coming space war, I didn't have all the data I needed. I had announced that there was a quite uh, a good possibility that they actually cloned this mummy and brought him back. The Freemasons revere this man like I was saying. Our leaders revere Akhenaten like no other. If you were to dig up The Secret Destiny of America by Manley P. Hall, who's a 33rd degree Freemason and one of their greatest uh, speakers and, and authors, you'll find The Secret Destiny of America, Chapter 2, is Akhenaten, the man born 2,000 years too early. Right? Uh, so, when I left the last talk, I, I left with the idea that I think Barack Obama is a clone of Akhenaten. This man, <laughs> Zahi Awaz. Now, he's been around since they found the tomb of Osiris. I don't know if you guys remember that. Back in the 90s, they found the tomb of Osiris. Now, Osiris is a lead god of the Egyptians, a god of death and resurrection. And this man's announcing that he found Osiris' tomb. Later, he was involved with the capping of the Great Pyramid with gold, which was canceled. Uh, but he was involved in the whole uh, Y2K celebration, which I cover in my first film, The Freeman Perspective. But Zahi kept other secrets from us, secrets that I only recently found out. Well, secrets that they've only now released. Because Zahi had actually uh, found, oh, that's, that's the tomb of Osiris. I'm sorry, I don't have these in the, in the best way that I could, but just bear with me. Okay, so Zahi announced that he had the genetic material of King Tut. And there's always been this mystery about King Tut and who's his daddy. Because they, they were certain Akhenaten was King Tut's dad. But no one could prove it because Akhenaten's mummy had never been found. Or so we were led to be able to believe. Lo and behold, after I announced the fact that I believe Barack Obama was a clone of Akhenaten and the entire family a clone of Akhenaten's families, this man came out and said, we're going to find out who's King Tut's daddy. And I said, oh, you are, are you? Now, you can watch this on the History Channel. And he announces suddenly, oh, by the way, we have the DNA of Akhenaten. 
So now I'm going, oh my God, you know, I've been saying all this, but I couldn't prove it because where was the DNA of Akhenaten? You see, the KV-55 mummy was found back in the 1920s. It's been a mystery for a hundred years. When the body was found mummified, they didn't know whether it was male or female. And this is because Akhenaten really has a strange shape. Uh, he, he, he's known as a hermaphrodite and often depicted as such with a cone head. So he was shown, and some try to say that he has Marfan syndrome or anything that they could do to come up with an understanding of why he has such a feminine body and then, a, you know, of course being a male. And then the cone head was always a bit strange as well. So when the mummy of Akhenaten was found, it was disputed right away because one doctor said, well, you found a woman. And another doctor said, no, it's a man. And for a hundred years plus, they have debated over whether the KV-55 mummy was Akhenaten. Now in this tomb, they also found the, the elder lady and the, the younger lady, and these turned out to be Queen T and, and Marita Ten. And so now I find that they actually have the DNA of all of the, the people <laughs> of the first family, right? So Zahi Hawass comes forward and says, well, yeah, we, we do actually have the DNA of Akhenaten. I know archaeologists and anthropologists have been debating about this for over a hundred years, but we couldn't tell you we had this DNA. It was a national security secret. You can look it up. I have it linked in on Freeman TV. Check it out for yourself. Zahi Hawass said that Akhenaten's DNA was a national security secret. Why? Well, you know, to say Obama was a clone and then now have the actual DNA there to say that they could have done so, that they're announcing they do have the DNA, but of course, you know, Akhenaten had a cone head. They couldn't exactly have a cone head show back up, and uh, I don't think people would have taken that so well. And so people started asking me, well, Freeman, you know, all right, you got the DNA. You, uh, Zahi Hawass himself built a multi-million dollar DNA lab in the basement of the Cairo Museum. And then was consequently fired. He has recently been fired for uh, taking sexual favors and bribes for archaeological digs. So he's out of the picture, thank God. But he left this DNA lab. He left the DNA of Akhenaten, and he was still in power when this was going on. So they say, all right, Freeman, you know, we've got the DNA, we've got all the potentials, we have the ability to clone a mummy, we've got the ability to clone a human, uh, but if they brought Akhenaten back, why doesn't he have a cone head? Well, maybe he did. <laughs> maybe he did. Next thing I know, people are talking about Obama's head scars. Big ol' X running across the, the cone of his head as if something was removed. Now they're talking about maybe brain surgery, maybe he's a, 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 a oh, <laughs> I think you, Manchurian candidate, I think for reading my mind. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe they implanted something in his head, but of course, uh, my study has been consistent, my information constant, and every time I try to come to a, you know, an example, and the next thing I know, there it is. And, and so now we've got the DNA, we've got the DNA lab, we've got the ability to clone humans, and we've got a president who looks just like Akhenaten. And then I announced that Akhenaten would, of course, have to deal with a coming space war. So when I left the talk, uh, you know, we, we discussed a lot about uh, the messianic character that is Obama. We talked about how his name, actually, Barack Obama, is Hebrew for lightning from heaven. So you can go look this up in your own concordance. Go check it out on freemantv.com if you want. I have it backed up there. Barack Obama, in the native tongue of Jesus, would be lightning from heaven. Now, if you don't know, the Bible de describes Satan. It says, and Satan fell like lightning from heaven. <laughs> Otherwise, you could say, and Satan fell like Barack Obama, if you were talking to Jesus. <laughs> now, that's the truth of the matter. All right, there were many curious notes to go back to the satanification of America that, that have to deal with Barack Obama. And I'm just going to play you a short clip of this because I want to get into deeper stuff.
If you guys want to follow this story longer, uh, of course, Obama cloning in the coming space war, uh, I didn't have the final details when I made that movie. I only had the beginning. And so now you can see that this was produced before they announced they had Akhenaten's DNA. It was produced before they announced that, they, that Obama came out on human cloning. It was produced before all of the things that are now, you know, pretty concrete evidence for me. Um, now, I'm just going to give you a little quick clip of what happens when you play Barack Obama's catchphrase, yes we can, backwards. <laughs> now, we know that's Satan's favorite tool, right? All right, so check this out. Hey, you say. Hey, you say. Okay. <laughs> that is. They, yes, we can. Just simply reversed. You all heard it very clearly, I believe. Thank you, Satan. Thank you, Satan. I'm not going to make you listen to that song. Uh, but you can check this out on the front page of Freeman TV. Uh, and, and then, you know, the next thing I know that happens is, is Barack himself ends up heading off to Egypt to meet with Zahi Huas. Now, there were a lot of mysterious things that happened at this moment. And I've gotten some insider information when uh, Barack visited, and I'll, I'll, I'll leak that to you. But uh, Zahi Was gave Barack Obama a tour of the pyramids. And in doing so, they happened to notice that Obama looked a lot like an Egyptian cartouche. <laughs> And he says, Barack Obama himself says, hey, that looks like me. And Zahi says, no, 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 I think you look more like King Tut. Now, Jack Blood, he asked me about this on the air one time, saying, uh, well, what do you think about them comparing Obama to King Tut? And of course, because I believe he's actually Akhenaten, I said, well, I think they're trying to discredit me and lead everybody towards King Tut, because no one knows of Akhenaten, but everybody knows of King Tut. So they've made depictions of Obama as King Tut and everything. I'm like, nah, they're screwing the story there. The true story is that he's King Tut's daddy. And that uh, there might be some other clones out there as well, and we're going to get to them. Actually, uh, Zahi met with Beyonce at one point, and we'll talk about her uh, faked pregnancy and the potential of her having a clone, and maybe even being a clone. Uh, and of course, Zahi said, well, she's a very stupid person. <laughs> now, Zahi is a very strict and rigid Egyptologist. He wants to stand firm that there are no ancient civilizations, that slaves built the Great Pyramids, and that even though it's physically impossible, to do, we we're talking about two million stones of a weight that are superior to what we have cranes today. We couldn't lift some of the blocks that built the Great Pyramids in the 21st century. But Zahi wants you to believe that there were no ancient civilizations, that there, this was just slave work, slave labor, and I, you know maybe they built a ramp, right? I don't know if you guys have seen the numerous methods they've said that they used. Well, Zahi. Um, he has an interesting beginning because he actually came out of a, a, a strange group based on Edgar Cayce. Edgar Cayce, of course, is famous for being a psychic, for uh, being able to, to picture people's illnesses through psychic means. Edgar Cayce also is a huge proponent of Atlantis, and he has done many talks on Atlantis. And he has constantly and consistently said, this is true. This is true. Atlantis existed. The high civilizations existed. Well, Zahi Hawass was actually paid by the Association of Research and Enlightenment, Edgar Cayce's group, to go to the University of Pennsylvania to become an archaeologist. Curious notes there. Now, I went to the ARE, and I asked them about this. I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought Zahi was a strict, no uh, ancient civilization type of character. And they were like, well, yeah, that's true. And I'm like, but he gives talks at the ARE on Atlantis? And they're like, well, yeah. Uh, well, I guess we never really thought about that. <laughs> but he was there last year, he was there the year before, and he's showing up to give talks on Atlantis. So, they're lying to you. There is an ancient story. There is an ancient past. 
and the potential of bringing this ancient past to life is too much for them to pass up. They are absolutely working towards this end. So, we find that there is uh, some sort of extraterrestrial connections to our, our ancient past. Uh, it seems to go to the stars Alpha Draconis and Sirius. And as you study more and more into secret societies, Freemasonry, you find that all of the ancient Egypt, Mayans, the Aztecs, uh, the Chinese, they all worship the star Sirius. She was known as Sothis in Egypt. Uh, Sirius is the symbol there you see that the Dogon tribe of Mali Africa use. This is from their ancient traditions that has been passed down throughout the ages, and they say it was the fish people that brought this knowledge to them. Now, I have been one talking about the merfolk for quite some time. <clears throat> we have a thing that is known as genetic memory. And we find that there are certain clues and keys around, like if you go look at a building and you see an owl sitting on top of that building, that's not there for some artistic reason. That's there because the genetic memory of birds reminds them that they don't want to be anywhere near that thing. So you gotta wonder about the big frost bank building and the effects that it's having on our genetics <coughs> and the way that this works. Because these birds have never seen an owl, they've never been attacked by an owl, but their memory, their genetic memory, knows that owl is a predator. And that's why you put them up on buildings so that your birds won't poop on everything. So we too have this genetic memory and, and these secret societies have been passing down this knowledge left and right, uh, coming back and forth with the examples Oh, that's a different story. Uh, right down to Austin, Texas, where you have the merfolk standing out in front of the goddess Columbia. And of course, this was put up at the, the, the tower, the UT Tower, back in 1933 by a Freemason, paid by a Freemason. So it was an Italian artist, Copini, who was paid by, uh, oh, what's the name of the hall here in Texas? The biggest guy there. Mass. No, uh, shoot. Uh, what's the name of the fountain? Littlefield. There we go. Uh, he is the one who, who painted or paid to have this statue put out there, which you'll find the merfolk sitting there out in front, and you'll find the goddess Columbia, who is actually Venus. Now, of course, the goddess Columbia is in direct due, due relationship with the clock tower, which Charles Whitman decided would be a great place to shoot people, and many others decided it would be a great day create a place to leap to their death. Uh, and of course, they die right behind George Washington, <coughs> who was also a lead Freemason. Uh, of course, the, the goddess in the Starbucks logo is, is the uh, Skyla, and this is, those are her feet that you see behind her head, not her hands. And this is how they used to explain sex with the fish people. Because the fish people, the merfolk, have been part of our story, part of the Atlantean story, and part of everything. But it also comes into our genetic memory. And so these men use these type of symbols to, to constantly encode us and to use it to trigger us in, in our genetic memories. But could it have an extraterrestrial source? Now this goes back, uh, the goddess is often related to the star Sirius and comes back through Freemasonry and all of their strange garbs and their unusual ways. Uh, Let's skip ahead. So our ancient past, once again, I gotta apologize for not having these in order. Where'd it go? So our ancient past has a lot of structures that we cannot explain, cannot define, don't know why or how they put them there. Uh, structures that are too big, uh, rocks that are massive with 33 angles that go together that you can't slide a piece of paper through. Construction that we wouldn't even consider doing, and yet we're trying to, they're trying to make us believe that the Aztecs left their fertile lands to go up to the northern rocky regions and build massive pyramids with no written language, all astronomically aligned, set up, to watch the stars. So what are these ancient structures that follow a, a, a cycle that's 26,000 years? 
the precession of the equinox. Now just take that into account. If we know of the precession of the equinox, the Egyptians knew of the precession of the equinox, you have to sit through 26,000 years to see it for the first time. You've got to sit through another 26,000 years to prove it. Say, so, yeah, this is happening uh, cyclical. So how do we get a precession of the equinox without 52,000 years of society to find it? But what these things do is actually they're giant spinometers on planet Earth because we can see when things are accelerating or decelerating. Uh, by watching the stars rise, especially Venus, watching Sirius rise, watching the sun rise, and they would have certain markers in each of these structures. Now you've got Chaco Canyon of the Native Americans, you've got the uh, pyramids of Peru, you've got the pyramids of Egypt, you've got Babylon, the list goes on and on of the ancient structures that follow the sun and follow the procession of the equinox to time, ancient time. We've got monoliths that they used in the temple of Baalbek, Lebanon. That's a person. Okay? <laughs> That's 1,500 tons. We couldn't even think about moving that thing in the 21st century. But there it is from ancient Baalbek. So there is a lot of structure and a lot of evidence to say that there was high technology in our ancient past. And now they are watching massive time. The beings that have been depicted now through exopolitics, through an exo, uh, that's extraterrestrial politics, is a new science coming forth. They've labeled them the Alpha Draconans and the Syrians. And so one is known as the dragon, or the Draco, and the other as the merfolk, or the fish people. So <laughs> lo and behold, if we don't have the dragon and the fish people in our main uh, programming structures and city-states, uh, not to mention that just the obelisk, the dome, and the pentagram are the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph for Sirius. So if you go stand downtown, you'll see you've got the clock tower as the, the phallus. You've got the goddess who represents Sirius herself and Venus. Uh, these two come together in, in Isis and Sothis. And then the capital dome with the goddess holding a pentagram on top. Now that is the hieroglyph for Sirius in uh, ancient Egyptian. And you'll also notice that that goddess on top of the capital looks very strange. I don't know if you've ever gotten a good close-up look. I have it in my film. Uh, she looks just like the depictions of the weird humans that existed back in Babylonian times. You start looking up pictures of Enlil and Enki and Ninharsag, and you're going to see these weird faces. They really got strange body structure. And of course, that's exactly what the goddess on top of the capital here looks like. Then I ended up at Manley P. Hall's library, this again, that 33rd degree Freemason that stood uh, and writes all of the, I'll get a close-up of this, um, who writes on all of the Masonic secrets. And this is the doorway to his library. And what you'll see here, let me go to the next picture. Well, I wanted you to notice that they're being worshipped. And then I'll give you a close-up. These are the doors of Manly P. Hall's library. You'll quickly notice that one is a reptile. He has reptilian slits in his eyes. I'm not sure when these doors were carved. It had to have been the early 1900s when Manly was around and doing this stuff. And then, of course, the other one, a fish man. And then, as I showed you, these men are being worshipped. And you'll notice that the reptilian is holding a pine cone. And this is typically a sign of the pineal gland in a way of getting inside of the third eye, the mind, and, and, and being able to transmit transcendentalism, right? And then the, mer, the merfolk, the merman, he has a penis staff, or reproduction, and, and you know, cloning and, and technologies. Well, the description that they gave of these two, oops, that's the wrong one, these two races from exopolitics themselves, now, when exopolitics came out, they weren't talking about the Pope and the Queen. But I happen to find that these things fit perfectly. So the Alpha Draconans control human elites, institutions, financial systems, keeping everybody in scarcity and struggle and insecurity. This is the way the reptilians stay in charge. This is the way they keep themselves in control. But their, their, their opponent, the Syrians, were ones that they could never defeat because the Syrians had so much technology that they couldn't defeat each other. So then they formed a union and maybe landed on planet Earth and started what we know of as the uh, divine right to rule. 
and their bloodlines carry on and on. Up to you to believe whether that's possible or not. But the symbolism is consistent. And of course, I have hundreds of hours going into this very story. Then I came to Barack Obama and his current state. And when we walked through the whole symbolism, I found that uh, they have a list of, of terror tactics they plan on using on us. Werner von Braun came forth to tell us uh, exactly what they had planned for us. And he seemed now, Werner von Braun, you know, he's a Nazi. An ardent Nazi, yes. SS, uh, full, full brotherhood, doing all the rituals and everything else that they had before them. And, <clears throat> of course, he came over to America for Project Blue Book, or, uh, I'm sorry, Project Paperclip, and began working with a, a young man known as Walt Disney. Well, Warner von Braun, now a jet propulsion laboratory scientist getting us up into space, uh, announced that there was going to be a method to bring about their Luciferian dialectic and their new world order. He said first they're going to use a red scare, they're going to use the, the Russian scare to, to start this uh, process of a new world order. Following that will be terrorism. And of course, that's where we were back in 9-11. They said after terrorism, will come asteroids. Well, so I just took Warner von Braun's word and said the next scare will be asteroids. So we've been through terrorism, we've been through uh, the Red Scare, it's time for asteroids. Well, lo and behold, as I said this, they announced, oh my god, there's an asteroid coming towards planet Earth and it's going to destroy all life in 2029. Or maybe 2036. Eh, maybe not at all. But the real reason we want to tell you about this is because the asteroid is named Apophis. You know, Apophis is the first serpent deity of destruction of Akhenaten's religion. In other words, it was Akhenaten Satan. <laughs> well, the asteroid they announced was named Apophis. So all of a sudden, I had Akhenaten in office battling his ancient nemesis, Apophis. <coughs> what were the odds? And of course, Werner von Braun having placed it all. <laughs> so... Following the, the scare tactics, the next scare tactics to come were extraterrestrials. So once they announced Apophis, Jet Propulsion's laboratories set out with their asteroid watch. They set out and put out the space-based space surveillance system. They started launching other uh, satellites up into space, started putting out different techniques of being able to watch deep space and, and to see into the infrared. So they put out the WISE telescope. They put out well, the Vatican put up their Lucifer telescope. <laughs> Let's get to that. So, next thing we know, everything's going right according to plan. Just as he had said, just as they were saying that they needed, uh, they needed all this surveillance to go up into space to make sure we were safe from any incoming bodies. Where did my folder? my folder of space news. Oh. Okay, so here is the news headline. It's called Apophis. It's 390 miles wide and it could hit Earth, right? So there, you know, there's the fear of Apophis. You know, just to prove it to you that I wasn't making that up. Uh, And the Vatican launches their Lucifer telescope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Vatican was like, well, it wasn't really us that named it. It was the Germans that made it. But <laughs> you'll see they went through a lot of effort to make sure that the Vatican's telescope was named Lucifer, being the large binocular telescope near infrared. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> near infrared utility with a uh, camera and integral field unit for extragalactic research. <laughs> yeah, we had to stretch a little bit to get that thing titled Lucifer, right? 
What the heck? <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's not that far away. Well, so then they started to seek the anti-universe. It wasn't enough to have space in our way. Uh, we had to start to see the other universe, the other side of things. And this involves CERN. Now, CERN's corporate logo is 666 with a hyperdimensional portal. CERN is a very interesting uh, company that we're going to talk more about. Uh, but they launched out the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which uh, went up to the International Space Station and is, is stationed there now to see the anti-universe, to see the dark matter, to see the other side. Because something has triggered them to start needing to get more into the infrared, to start seeing deeper into the, the other worlds. And at the same time, they've decided that they might want to see inside of closer worlds. So right at this moment, we have the Grail uh, satellite system, which is mapping the surface of the moon and also the inside of the moon. If you guys remember the bombing of the moon, anybody? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, they bombed the moon. Now, this was uh, ridiculous because one, you know, it cost that $79 million to crash the lacrosse rocket into the moon. And it had already been done. The Japanese had sent up their Kyuga satellite and crashed it into the moon to see what would happen. India sent up their Chandrayaan-1 and determined that there was all kinds of water on the moon. This was months before we ever launched NASA's lacrosse mission to bomb the moon. And it was my personal belief that the bombing of the moon was actually to strike it like a gong so that it would ring so that then they could use com computer tomography to be able to see inside of the moon. So much like uh, in Jurassic Park, when they pound the ground and they can see the bones of the dinosaur underground, you pound the moon and they can choose HARP, uh, a high frequency of uh, active auroral research program, or any of these ionospheric heaters actually can then see inside of the moon and they found it was hollow, at least 70%. Then they went to, to Mars's moon because, well, Buzz Aldrin, he wanted you to know that there was a monolith on the moon of Mars. And he wanted to make sure you knew this. So they put him on the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, talking about the monolith on Mars. They put him on 30 Rock, talking about the monolith on Mars. He was on Dancing with the Stars with Pamela Anderson, talking about the monolith on Mars. Start to embed the idea of alien cultures into our world. Now, Buzz says it was either aliens or gods that put it there. I'm not sure which. But so they sent up another system up there. It's called the Marsis. And this kind of goes to Mars and Isis. And uh, these are the two uh, fighting gods that really, if you want to get deeper into the story, you've got to get to uh, Velikovsky in Worlds in Collision. And you'll find that, that Venus was a comet that came into our solar system and that it caused great havoc in the entire solar system until it settled down. But then it had kind of sent Mars off on its own careening path. And so most of the ancient stories of catastrophe, the deluge, and, and uh, the stories in, I believe it was Isaiah, or Joshua, uh, telling the story of incoming asteroids, incoming fireballs, and then followed by this massive, uh, while well, the Earth stood still. Um, so now they have sent up rockets to Mars's moons, Phobos and Deimos. Now this means fear and panic are the names of Mars's moons. Now Phobos has been one that has been very strange. Now no one ever saw Mars's moons until 1877, even though we had telescopes long before that. Uh, suddenly there they were. And now we have uh, gone and investigated with the Marsus and we found out that Phobos was hollow. Now, Phobos is the one that every satellite that's ever been sent to it has vanished. And recently, the Russian uh, satellite, uh, Phobos, what did they call that one? Phobos Grunt, has just recently crashed back to Earth. Uh, this was just in the news not long ago. So once again, another lost Phobos satellite. But the Marsus program managed to go in silent running, as if it was some sort of silent submarine. They shut down all electronics, they shut down all systems, except for the ones necessary to see inside of Phobos. And they did. And they reported it hollow. They also reported, well, we won't be able to show you a picture of the monolith. They brought it up again. Uh, 
because we had to shut off all the electronics to do a silent running to Phobos. This is all going on in your space right now. So the next portion of the story, after Werner von Braun had told us that we'd make it through asteroids, the next part was extraterrestrial. Extraterrestrial threat was what's needed. And so, of course, all of a sudden, we've got films, the event, we've got V, we've got, you know, endless alien stories. Did you know that the day the Earth stood still, which, uh, once again, goes back to the Mars-Venus story, but the movie itself, have you seen this new one? Uh, it pretty much depicts humanity as a lost cause, and that any aliens that wanted to come visit should probably just wipe us all out. Right? If you watch the movie, that's, the, that's pretty much the moral of the story. Well, they decided this would be a really good movie to send to Ursa Major. So it was simulcast. While people were watching in the theater, they had simulcast the day the air stood still to Ursa Major. Or, I'm sorry, Alpha, no, wait. Alpha, Alpha Centauri. Centauri. That's right, they sent the Doritos commercial to Ursa Major. <laughs> <laughs> with with the, the device iScat. Now, you guys might remember iScat because it was right below this. All right, iSCAT is another antenna array, much like the HARP system, which many people have heard about. Uh, I did make the first documentary on HARP, by the way, ever. <laughs> uh, but this was a big story here at Brave New Books, thanks to Lucas, and a, a really large story on my website as well, because I had been covering this thing for quite some time. Before it happened, I was discussing these clouds and their spirals. Okay, so this wasn't the first one to happen. Do how many of you are familiar with the Norway spiral, or is this new news? Okay, yeah, many people saw Lucas's production. Uh, <clears throat> the Norway spiral was was fairly easily explained, and, and what had happened is in America we launched what was known as the Cloud of Care, and Care stood for the Charged Aerosol Release Experiment, and what they did was launch a rocket up into the upper atmosphere, about 177 miles up which is just about the exact height of the International Space Station. And they released an aluminum oxide cloud, which then burst out and looked like some hole had opened in the galaxy, and then it sucked itself up and vanished, right? And uh, I covered the launch live on my website and from my radio show on the Free Zone. And then the news broadcast about the cloud of care, but they didn't know what it was. They said, we've checked with all authorities. We've, I, no one knows what this thing is. And yet I covered it live on my show. <laughs> and I think that the news probably could have figured it out. But instead of telling you that it was an aluminum oxide cloud launched up to test noctilucent clouds, they said, we think it's aliens. <laughs> and I got that news clip in the film, so you can see it for yourself. Well, the noctilucent cloud with the aluminum oxide cloud that they, they sent out uh, is made of sapphire. And so the very first scientist to have a look at the Norway spiral will say, well, it's obviously aluminum oxide because you can see the blue of the sapphires emitting from it. Now, the cloud of care didn't form a spiral like this. The cloud of care, it did spiral because the rocket spiraled as it ejected it, but it didn't make a, a crazy pattern such as this. What we got here is that right down here at the bottom of this hill is the iSCAT antenna array in Norway. And so what it seems is they're pulsing this thing with their ionospheric heater. Now iSCAT has the capability, like I say, to send Doritos commercials to Ursa Major. I'm not exactly sure what they're testing with this system, but I've been watching a lot of them. And this isn't the only one. It's been over Russia, over China, over Norway and over America, so this is uh, something new that they're, they're dealing with. But of course, they're trying to bring us to the fear of alien invasion. So of course, the Vatican came forth, and uh, they said, well, we're going to have a massive ET conference, and uh, they had their scientist, uh, their reverend uh, Benjamin Funes, come forward and say, well, yeah, aliens are real, yeah, and they didn't suffer original sin because they weren't born of Eve. Yeah, so now we got the Vatican saying, well, yeah, aliens are real, and they're, they're better than us. Another Vatican astronomer, this guy, very strange, he's actually the curator of the Pope's personal meteor collection, and he came forward and said, well, yeah, I'd baptize E.T. if he showed up. 
But Benjamin Funes, he was actually sent off to uh, work with CERN. And as soon as Benjamin Funes, this guy was uh, admitting absolutely, you know, absolutely aliens are real, now he's working with CERN, and uh, they're launching off this alpha magnetic spectrometer to see into the anti-universe. And as you see, I have many uh, different, different examples of these strange missiles. And then uh, NASA got involved, and they got a Rothschild to be their alien ambassador. Yeah, imagine that. Uh, Lynn de Forrester Rothschild, or Lynn Forrester de Rothschild, is now the NASA alien ambassador. And they weren't the only ones. Uh, they was also brought forth by the Royal Society, had a massive meeting on it. The UN announced their alien ambassador, <coughs> who was uh, Maslin Othman. And she categorically denies being the ambassador to aliens, but that was the point she was given. So, uh, Maslin Offman. So, all of a sudden, we had the Royal Society, we had the Vatican, we had the UN, we had America, NASA, all coming together and getting together their alien ambassadors ready to take on what's to come. <clears throat> Meanwhile, they began launching off into space. The secret space war carried forward, and most people don't know about the flying Twinkie. Maybe some of you have heard of this. <laughs> it is known as the X-37B, and is a mini space shuttle about the size of a pickup truck that is robotic and carries around with it some sort of secret space program. But so the X-37B, NASA and Boeing's uh, accomplishment at a secret space program, is now orbiting us right now. It has all kinds of crazy antenna arrays. It is a military vehicle. It is not at all a, a uh, you know, private space program like SpaceX or anything. It is, it is military. Along with that, they launched the HTV-2, the hypersonic technology vehicle, which uh, they lost three times, but after not losing it, um, they actually found out that it can make it across the ocean in about 15 minutes. Um, I forgot the exact speed, uh, but many times over the speed of sound. Which ocean? Uh, over the Pacific. Uh, it can make it from, I think they said it can make it from California to New York in 10 minutes. And it's up there now, you know, it's, it's ready to drop in at any moment. And meanwhile, we have many antenna arrays around the globe. This one is in Australia. And as I began talking about it, lo and behold, if there wasn't this strange droid eye that started showing up in the satellite relays. So all of a sudden now we've got, and you'll see that's directly over the antenna array, which is right here. And uh, the Learmouth uh, Solar Observatory is there as well. Now, I've had some theories about what's going on, and of course I often go back to the secret societies and their, their symbols and their messages, and they constantly speak of the second sun. And there's always the symbolism of the two suns, even Barack Obama's symbol of the rising sun, or Target's symbol of the sun, and the sun behind the sun was always a key figure. Well. It's been found that there was a, a potential binary star for our solar system. It's known as G1.9. And strangely, it looks exactly like the Firefox logo. All right? Now, we found that most solar systems are binary. Most of them do have a second sun, some even trinary like uh, Sirius. But when you were in a binary star system, you know, you go out and you get pulled away and you move slower as you get distant. But then as these two suns start to come together, speed picks up. And the closer we get to the second sun, the faster everything goes. But you would never be able to determine this from Earth because all the planets would be speeding up, the entire solar system would be speeding up, and so everything would stay relatively the same. But if you had giant monolithic structures that watched long distances of time, you would know when the planet started to speed up. 
Many have talked about the, the potential of, of some sort of catastrophe coming our way. We had Elenin, we had Planet X, uh, well, we had the String of Pearls event where the comet struck Jupiter. Uh, but I personally believe in this binary star system. And there is a group of scientists in Spain, uh, star viewers, who have announced that G1.9 is heading straight towards us. NASA says, no, no, it's an exploding nova, it's just getting bigger. And they said, no, it's getting bigger because it's heading at us, and we are heading at it. Now, of course, this always goes back to the ancient stories and the ancient past, and uh, we find that, you know, we, we have these certain triggers that bring about fear. And, of course, one of these triggers, other than, yes, we can, being, thank you, Satan, is uh, 666. I don't know if you know, but in Hebrew, six looks like this. <laughs> so your monster, 666. So 666 is one of these things that's coded in as a trigger, you know, to make us worry that it's the number of the beast, and what is it? What is 666? Well, in English, the word F-O-X, or fox, actually uh, transliterates into 666, because F is the sixth letter, O is the 15th letter, and X is the 24th fourth letter. So, you know, one and five, two and four, six, six, six. Uh, so Fox. And of course, as I showed you, the uh, G1.9 looks exactly like the Fire Fox or Fire 666 logo. All right. Uh, Conoco also breaks down into 666 in a pentagram. And uh, of course, Disney and Monster. And you'll find numerous 666s all around. And then it also boils into uh, the VW logo. So if you took it to Hebrew, you've got three V's because you're crossing two V's to make three, and there you have, once again, 666. But the 66 is actually the number of the fallen angels, according to Kabbalistic practices, which is what our leaders follow. And so W actually is the letter or number 66 of the fallen angels. And this is why in Star Wars they say execute order 66 and they kill all the Jedi. And then you'll also notice in your new story of Fringe, as they go to the other dimension in Fringe, they're all got FF on their logos, uh, which again goes back to this uh, fallen angel scenario. Okay, so let's move right ahead. Uh, if you want to get deeper and deeper into that story, which I could go on and on about it, uh, you have to pick up the DVDs. <laughs> I got it all. Or just go to freemantv.com. Everything's free there if you want. Uh, so now we've got the whole story where we're looking at this situation. They're trying to program society. They've been through the different scare tactics. We've had the, uh, the different, um, the Red Scare, the A-Terrorists, the Asteroids, and now we're up to aliens. And of course they're programming this uh, through all the different media streams and they want to program the, ch the youth into proper reactions to the, the systems that they're going to bring about. So in order to program the youth, they use all their, their tactics of uh, comic books, car cartoons, uh, commercials, billboards, uh, you know, whatever. And they're using this to program a dark hero or this fallen angel type character. So you'll see that they, they killed off Superman back in 2000. Now Superman is a, a quintessential Nephilim. He is he's a fallen angel that came to Earth, has superpowers, and is able to, you know, well, leap buildings with his... But they killed off Superman, they turned him into six clones, which I thought was pretty interesting, but these six clones didn't really take off. The one clone that they made sure was primary was a black Superman who carried guns. No, I don't like what Superman need with guns. Nothing. But it's for programming the youth, for programming what they want you to be. But then they this says, ah, let's do away with Superman, let's make Hellspawn our, our true character at work. So Hellspawn was brought into the picture through Image, Image Comics. So Superman dies, he's replaced by Hellspawn. Hellspawn fights pedophilic rapists. That's, that's his... Uh, Hey, you've given these comics to children, you know? Batman, he also died in 2000. He had his back broken by Bane, and he was replaced by a character known as Azrael. Well, Azrael just happens to be the fallen angel that uh, taught warfare and, and wearing high heels and makeup to uh, 
the people in the book of Enoch. So suddenly Batman was a fallen angel. And then, of course, B for Vendetta, which you'll find at all your Occupy movements. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, go to our, our YouTube channel. I've, I've been to every Occupy movement there is. Uh, I'll tell you all about that as soon as we're done. But of course, everybody dressing up in the B for Vendetta mask, which is very curious because B, uh, the character that he's portraying is Guy Fox, and Guy Fox was the original fall guy, the guy who took all the blame for the gunpowder plot, even though he wasn't guilty. But that's where we get the term fall guy, and now a Kabbalist magician who practices secret rituals of magic behind locked doors has gotten everyone to wear this face for protests. Yeah. This is how Hollywood works. So one step further, and uh, Disney takes over for Marvel. So now you know where your programming is coming from. Because, you know, I showed you uh, Warner Von Braun with Disney. And Disney uh, has control over most of our, our propaganda. Now, Warner Von Braun and, and Walt Disney put together what they called Project X otherwise known as the Experimental Prototype Civilization of Tomorrow, or EPCOT. And what they did is they put you through this whole system, which is actually produced by military industrial corporations. My dad worked for Martin Marietta, building nuclear missiles, and Martin Marietta has a ride inside of EPCOT. Uh, you can uh, put the list together. Siemens takes care of that big ball they've got in there. And I thought I had a picture of the... Uh, and Siemens, of course, is the uh, very corporate logo that you will see on Auschwitz. So when you go into Walt Disney World, you give them your credit card, you uh, go in, and then they say, well, you'd be a whole lot safer <laughs> if you just gave us your fingerprint. Yeah. So then they got your credit card, your fingerprint, but they don't have your picture yet until you get in that big ball from Siemens. And then they take your photograph and they ask you, well, what's your favorite vacation? And they take your little face and they put it on a cartoon and you get to watch yourself on your favorite vacation, which of course is all programming. And then as you get off the ride, you come down, your face goes out of the ride and goes to your home state. And they are databasing everyone that goes through this park. Everybody's facial recognition, everybody's fingerprint. And if you want to, you can spend a little extra money and have your face planted in titanium out front. Just so it'll be there for the end of the world. Okay, so Disney is a military industrial complex. Disney admits that no, they've had no greater campaign to get people to pay their taxes. What is that doing? Than Donald Duck. <laughs> Donald Duck did more to get people to pay their income taxes than any campaign the government ever tried. They have so much so that Disney boasts, well, you know what? Joseph Goebbels, the propagandist of the Nazis, took Walt Disney's tactics to program their children. You go watch Disney on the front lines, and you see, they'll boast to you how the Nazis were just so <laughs> admiring of Walt Disney's work that they decided to, to program their youth in the same way. That's not the other way around. Well, it's a small world after all. You know, and they are in the eugenics. Yes, that is the eugenic programming right there. It's a small world after all. Okay, so, so now they start to get into a little more mind control programming. And of course, Walt Disney is the man behind the mask. The one you see here is Alan Moore, the magician I was telling you about who programmed all of these people. And Madonna, of course, connected with Disney. Britney, of course, connected with Disney. Justin Timberlake, connected with Disney. Christine Aguilera, connected to Disney. Michael Jackson, connected to Disney. All right, they're all Disneyites. All Disneyites. And the Sorcerer's Apprentice. And they're using these means and methods to start to program the children. And what do they want to program them into? Blood sacrifice. Okay, this is the VMA Awards. She did this on American Idol as well, you know, nice uh, child time programming. Uh, she promotes herself as a Luciferian character with burning 
angels on the stage. And once again, this being at a video music awards, not you know video where it's just this is live and in front of children. And Lady Gaga, of course, is the one that they have brought forward so that we could all talk about her, to make this almost an open agenda, to bring it all to the forefront. Because Lady Gaga, in Rolling Stone magazine, claims that she dreamt of this Illuminati ritual where she had a child laying down on a bed, strapped, and she had slit the wrists and was pouring honey into the wounds. You can go read this in Rolling Stone magazine, Lady Gaga, and her mother. Her mother says, oh, Gaga, that sounds like an Illuminati ritual. And what the heck does Gaga's mom know about Illuminati rituals, right? You know, pouring honey in the, I've never heard of this before. I study this stuff, right? <laughs> what? So she's bringing it all forward. Her latest news, of course, is that she was in a London hotel with a bunch of uh, Scottish Rite Freemasons. This just came out. Of course, it happened, I think, in November. But the press is just now coming up with it. And left a bathtub full of blood in the hotel. Yeah, check it out. It's in the news right now. And of course she was meeting with a bunch of Freemasons. It's of the Lord. Now, when you... This also goes back to the Scarlet Woman of the Ordo Templi Orientis, which is more of a sexual occult order uh, based uh, loosely on Freemasonry. It's kind of a, another sect of Freemason, a pendant body of Freemasonry, the Ordo Templi Orientis, uh, OTO, and they worship the Scarlet Woman, who is supposed to be the uh, herald of revelations. And so, uh, you know, there you see her as the Scarlet Woman, and of course the bloody sacrifice. Um, now, the Freemasons, they will come out and they, they put on these rituals inside of locked doors. And I've been to more Mason temples than Masons, and I can tell you all about what I've seen. And I've also seen that Roy Kroc of McDonald's is a Freemason. Uh, Dave Thomas of Wendy's is a Freemason. Colonel Sanders is a Freemason. And these are just a few of the obscure ones. Uh, you know, all your food are weapon systems, all these fast food companies. And of course, every corporate logo is a Masonic logo. But this is what you would dress up like if you were going to go into a Mason Lodge and take your oath of agreement, which is binding yourself under no less penalty than to have your throat cut across, your tongue pulled out by the roots, and buried in the rough sands of the sea. Uh, and you wear a noose around your neck, and you're blindfolded, and you have a, you know, a pant leg rolled up, and your shirt bared, and all of that. Well, so lo and behold, at the Video Music Awards, what happens to Pink? <laughs> She shows up in full Masonic regalia. Yes. You'll see that instead of the rolled up pant leg, she has the, uh, the checkerboard floor of a Freemason. Let me see if I can get both those pictures up at once so you can see it together. This is pink from... Uh... So what dirt do you have on Taylor Swift? Taylor Swift, uh, she was actually, uh, she was tried, she was the one, did they ridicule her on stage, was well, that her? She was yeah. wearing red too. Yeah, well she came out in white, oh. and then was it Jay-Z? Kanye. 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 Kanye, comes out, ridicules her, now we got Jay-Z, no, Kanye no, connection no, with the Freemasons and yeah, the whole. The new yeah. one, Lana Del Rey, which then Brian Williams and NBC News, after she had a very bad performance on Saturday Night Live, said, the worst Saturday Night Live musical guest ever. Right. Well, you know, most of them can't sing. They they have they, they, they have auto tunes going on like Britney, you know, oh, poor yeah. girl. Oh, uh, no, it's it's covered up with body He was they couldn't afford for him to get the word out because he was gonna start exposing them like what happened. Or was he killed? I have another theory. So now you see that they are actually programming your youth and they are putting all of this into the system and engineering a new type of family, as Disney ABC calls it. Um, and of course, the, the new modern family are transvestites. And you'll know that the Nazi party was actually formed in a gay bar. I don't know if you know this, but the Nazi party was very gay. And they actually did not like effeminate gays, so they would get rid of effeminate gays, but they loved the hardcore gays. Have you seen Washington? The brown, the brown shirt, mostly gay. Have you seen Washington? 
Washington. And his, and his little boyfriend, Lafayette? Yeah, well, as a, uh, just a little side note here. A month after Michael Jackson died, this turned up in the Chicago Museum. Now, our current timeline believes that this bust has always been in the Chicago Museum. But my timeline says different. <laughs> because now we're talking about time travel and extra dimensional travel. Uh, I interviewed the, the head of the Time Travel Institute and he told me that I was most likely correct about Michael Jackson. Now, Michael Jackson, he knew that he was in trouble. And he came out on 9 10 2001 and gave a New World Order talk. And, uh, well, of course, you know, you, his, his family, when, when, uh, when questioned as to why Michael died, they said the Illuminati killed him. Now, whenever somebody says that, don't, don't take that serious, because the Illuminati is a catch-all phrase. It's not a, a, the Bavarian Illuminati. It's, it's just a catch term that, that came out in our current time because conspiracy theory is a new science. So now we just kind of use it as a catch-all phrase for the Brotherhood. Well, Michael Jackson hired a roboticist to transfer his soul into the robot so that he wouldn't have to die. And so that when we did have human cloning up to a, a proper potential, he could then transmit his soul into that body, like Avatar. This is why I often don't think that Barack Obama is actually Akhenaten himself, but just Akhenaten's clone. And you can see that, you know, the comparison is, is pretty... Right? Um, and I have to superimpose like the Barack and Otten pictures. But what happened was a month after Michael Jackson's death, uh, now when we say death, you know, he was shown climbing out of the back of the coroner's vehicle. I don't know if you guys followed this that close. Uh, he was shown pacing around in the back of the, the room as they were doing the news story about his death. You can go see all this. I've got it saved in a file called Weird Stuff on my YouTube. And then next thing you know, Michael Jackson's hiring this roboticist, and, and this was years back, to, to transmit his soul into this body. But then Michael Jackson goes off to a very rich store, uh, I forgot the name of that, but a very expensive store, and he starts buying all kinds of multi-million dollar things there, and, including King Tut's gold sarcophagus, or a replica. And now the, the guy following him around with the camera, this is the same guy who filmed him holding the baby over the, the balcony, same guy's in the room with Michael Jackson, and he, he asked Michael, well, you know, why are you buying all this stuff? You know, are you going to get buried in King Tut's tomb? And he said, no, no, this is for my other mansion. This is for my other mansion, which was never disclosed where this other mansion was. But if you start to take this story and you start to follow it quite a bit, uh, as I was telling you about I. Scott being able to send Doritos commercials to Ursa Major or um, Mind Transfer Technologies, we are just now becoming capable. I'm glad you brought up Michael, because I had forgotten. You can't forget about Michael. Yeah. <laughs> I personally believe that he is sitting back. What about Elvis? <laughs> I got a whole other story about Elvis, but you'll have to talk to Paul Laffley about that one. We're just biological robots. Huh? Well, the thing of it was, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but the, the entire SG-1 characters are actually the Obama administration, and this was put out to you by the... Yeah. And this was produced by the United States Space Force. Check the credits. Check the credits. All right, and, and what's this character? <laughs> Apophis, right? So now Obama's like not an Apophis. What the heck? All right, but CERN, CERN now, we've got nations, Israel, begging to give them billions of dollars. We've got nations all over the world giving CERN billions of dollars. Do you think this is to find the Higgs boson? Is this to find the God particle? Uh, why are nations paying so much money into this thing? A large hadron collider. What is it? It's named Atlas and Alice. So we've got the king of Atlantis, Atlas, and Alice through the looking glass, down through the portal, right? Well, one thing that most people don't know about CERN, now they are about to announce whether or not they've actually found the God particle or not. The latest news is we're about to announce whether or not we figured anything out. Uh, but they have another contraption attached to CERN that many people don't know about or even discuss or anything, but it's the LHC grid. And the LHC grid is a massive 200,000 interlock computers that have all their own direct fiber optic lines, and it is the, the most massive 
computation device ever been created on planet Earth. Now the LHC grid has been moving in its, comp uh, uh, in its uh, computations and it moved from petabytes to exabytes. Now of course none of us know what the heck that is, but an exabyte is one quintillion bytes. So you thought you had something with a gigabyte, right? No. An exabyte is one quintillion. Quintillion? How do you say that? Quintillion? I mean, it's like, oh my God. How can the United States stop building their own super collider? Well, because of ants, right? <laughs> no, there was the RIC, and the RIC, uh, the Relativistic Heavy Ionic Collider, which collided gold particles and folded space time, which they still haven't figured out, right? So that's another story. Uh, but yeah, we are absolutely working with time travel through the American studies, which is the Relativistic Heavy Ionic Collider. The Large Hadron Collider of CERN, actually, with its grid, pushing exabytes. Now, it would take five exabytes to store the entire written catalog of planet Earth. Every written word could be stored in five exabytes. And that's how massive this is. But what they found is they were doing a, what they called, uh, there was a different group known as the Blue Brain Project, and they're the ones working on mind transfer technology. They found that they can transmit your soul, they put in quotes, into a, a computer. But this computer has to be capable of processing exabytes. Guess what? CERN is. So now if you compound this, you take it together and you say, okay, we've got the LHC grid capable of mind transfer technology. We have ionospheric heaters such as ISCAT that can shoot commercials to uh, Doritos to Ursa Major. Then we could then take like Avatar, transmit our souls into this computer and shoot it off to the next star as long as you had something there waiting to receive it. So... What could we have waiting to receive it? Well, currently, they almost evacuated the International Space Station as the Russian rocket blew up on the launch pad or crashed back down to Earth before it could come up, and they weren't going to be able to get any more supplies up to the ISS or the ISIS. And uh, so they were going to evacuate the International Space Station. And this would have left six adult stem cells and Robonaut 2, hanging out with four iPhones. Now these six adult stem cells that are sitting up on the International Space Station, launched by the last Atlanta space shuttle, which was the 33rd launch of the space shuttle, uh, which was supposed to be uh, the launch 233, but then they moved it, switched it, put it backwards, and they put 234 before 233. It was very confusing, couldn't figure it out. But Robonaut 2 is now up and functioning in the International Space Station and hanging out with six adult stem cells that were launched up with the iPhones. This was the last mission of the space shuttle. Now these six adult stem cells are there for human longevity. They're there to study human longevity. And Robonaut 2 is a telepresence robot, which means you can transmit yourself into it. So that's what's going on in the International Space Station at this point. I think there's lots more to our story than meets the eye. And uh, the programming that they are, are conditioning all of us to is to the dark hero and a warrior type mentality. Um, I think that we've reached the end of this portion of the story of E.T. and the transhumanist agenda. And we should all take a quick pause before I come back and tell you. Well, let me go ahead and go through this real fast. Okay, so the elite began building a global society. And they were uh, building new structures, new cities, and, and preparing for this new global society. Each of these cities are actually extraterrestrial because they can launch into space. There's Astana in Kazakhstan, Canberra in Australia. And of course, uh, DC and in America, we have. But the newer cities that they're putting up. Well, first of all, <laughs> we're led by this man right here. Yoda. Now, Henry Kissinger set out to uh, get the UN control over uh, well the world, and he had set up ten regions of, of America for the ten regional governors to to uh, control. And of course, Barack Obama has just now announced that he has the legislation set and they are picking the 10 regional governors. Uh, this was, uh, you know, in coordination with Richard Nixon, that they set up this UN 
regional zones. But Richard uh, Henry Kissinger was the main overseer of the city of Astana. And Astana, that means threshold, and is a new uh, city of the strangest city you could imagine. Now from the air, Astana is set up as an ancient seal of Solomon to find spirits. It actually looks just like this. And this is the Bicentennial Mall in Nashville, which is also designed exactly as a seal of Solomon to find spirits. Then you get above Canberra in Australia, uh, the next global governance location. And of course, it looks like a seal of Solomon to bind spirits. So I've been tracking these different cities as the, the New World Order 21st century capitals, and they are preparing these as the new city-states to take over once the catastrophes or whatever calamity that they're intending will bring about. Here are the seals. You can see the, the symbol, you see the, uh, the curvature, and then these break down into a star sign that uh, can be tracked back to, I believe it was Sirius. And Solomon had designed 72 of these seals to bind the different spirits that he had uh, conjured, the demons as they call them. And you will very quickly see that these two can be compared very easily. You'll see the curvature, the line, and then that, that, uh, this here coming up, there's actually an obelisk over here that stands up. Uh, each of the things are actually included in there, and so they are designing the new cities to be seals of demons. Where was Astana? Astana is in Kazakhstan. They're actually building the first indoor city there right now. Uh, one of the richest places, you know, that's Dubai, and, uh, or no, I'm sorry, Dubai is the other one that I was tracking was, uh, as one of the same. Now, Dubai is announcing that they will be the leader in privatized space programs. And of course, what's in Dubai? Atlantis, right? Okay, so... Boy, I don't feel like I, I concluded this on a, on a great plot because I wanted to get deeper and deeper into what the solutions are. So I want to I wanna close this up and we're running out of time. So let's leave that there. You are living on a planet now, and I'll just give you my final statements on this, where human cloning is an absolute potential and probability the elite of our world now see that they have the ability to transfer their minds into a cloned body. Therefore, eugenics works for them. They can kill off all of us and need to kill off all of us because they're going to live forever. They are certain of this. They've had all the evidence from their ancient past to lead them and guide them forward into this belief. They are now seeking the anti-universe, trying to find ways to break holes into it using CERN. And, and get to the other dimension. They are looking at ways of traveling through space without a body, and they uh, are designing ancient seals of Solomon as new city plans in their new global world order. And all of it is going exactly according to plan, and this is only because we are all programmed and conditioned to respond in a particular manner. And so all of the television shows, the different methods that we have been given to fight these people are exactly the wrong answers. So going up against riot squads at a, you know, with shields and whatnot is stupid, fruitless, and futile. I've been there, I've done it, I've been to the IMF WTO protests, 500,000 people gathered together to say they were against these organizations. What did the news say? Angry protesters fighting cops in the streets. And there was not a lick of violence in Washington, D.C. while I was there. But somehow the media found a, a story to, to show violence at this protest, even though there wasn't any. Unless, you know, maybe somewhere off in a corner, somewhere, they found the violence. And then they made sure that that was the only picture in every newspaper all across the United States. Even though there were thousands of photographers and news crews there, one photo was shown throughout all of the news. Uh, they are programming us to be these angry, rebellious characters. They are constantly predicting this, programming it into the Hollywood mainstream so that we look at things and we want to oppose them. And what they are not doing is guiding us to our own synchronistic selves, to the fact that we are guided by the divine, that we actually all have a soul's purpose that is there for us to follow, and it has been usurped, stolen, and taken away 
through religion and finances. Money is a spell that denied you God. And now we all believe and think that that's the only method of, of salvation. And so we consistently and constantly go back to the elite to try and save ourselves when they want nothing but us dead. So we need to turn our tail and move away from this uh, aggressive opposition. And we start to move towards what we're calling the friendship agenda. And we do have a new social network site called friendshipagenda.com so that we can all meet up, talk, and actually meet in the real space. You, know, we, you can go there and join, and then you can meet with all the people. They're all amazing, wonderful people that I have met personally and had them all join. We're up to about 1,200 members now. Uh, we decided that friendship was the only answer to this solution, that the bonds of friendship surpass all of the elite programming, and that once you start to know your neighbor, once you start to grow gardens with them, once you start to have block parties on your street, they have no more power. Because suddenly you realize, wow, we're all human. We're all here together and we actually love and are beautiful beings. But they consistently want you to believe that humans are nefarious, evil creatures that will do nothing but destroy their neighbor. We have to disprove that. And we have to prove it to the world and share that with the world. So now we have the mainstream media. We have the media means of promoting ourselves. We are now YouTube stars. Uh, I'm currently going to be in a movie with uh, one someone made famous through YouTube, a transvestite known as Chris Crocker. Uh, you might remember him from Leave Britney Alone. Well, <laughs> he is now famous, all right? And he has the ear of the world. He's hanging out partying with Paris Hilton because he put up a YouTube clip. So we have power now. And they're going to try and take that. We all know that. SOPA and all of the other things trying to get rid of us, but uh, they're not going to. And through this media stream, we can actually start to represent ourselves as the humans that we are. And I've begun this myself. I have the Mystery School Mobile Media Lab experiment. I'm driving around now in my big yellow school bus. Hopefully that will become more of a further bus along the way. I've seen what Jeff Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters did, and it was hardly anything, and they changed the world. I plan on doing a whole lot more. So we've got our big yellow school bus. We're heading off on the friendship agenda, and we're meeting up with Tesla scientists, permaculturists, and we, well, every city that we go to, unlike the Occupy movements, we are making an impact. We are planting gardens. We are making sure that the, the neighborhoods learn how to plant gardens, teaching them how to build worm farms, teaching them how to properly cater to these lost lands that need to be replenished with uh, you know, the, the proper nutrients to get the worm farms going, get the ormus going. And on top of this, we are meeting up with the Tesla scientists and we are going to put together what we call the Type 1 Roadshow. And it's going to be this crazy display because somebody put me in charge. And uh, you know, I don't slack. I don't slack. I'm going to make this thing blow up. It's going to happen in Philadelphia in October for the first one, but then we're going to bring it to Austin, Texas. Right. It's just as cool here. So after all the programming that we see, after everything that we see from them trying to get you to engineer you into these bloodthirsty sacrificial lambs that are doing nothing but killing people in modern warfare, we've got to turn around to our friends, to our loved ones, to our, our true communion with the divine and find ourselves once again so that we can then display this to the rest of the world because the rest of the world thinks we're Satan. And there's no doubt that because of Jersey Shore, because of all the different media programming that they're sending over there to say, look at these horrible humans in America. They're a bunch of Satanists and they don't care about anything. We've got to turn that puzzle around. And it's not going to be an easy thing to do, but if we can take over the mainstream, if we can then even just use YouTube as I have done, I'm now in two movies, two Hollywood productions that will come out this year. One was me at the zoo, which was all about Chris Crocker and his transvestite, uh, you know, holy moment, <laughs> like uh, a double rainbow guy, right? I mean, double rainbow guy was huge. All you gotta do is cry at a rainbow, and this gets the attention. But people are feeling the human nature that double rainbow guy gives, right? And they're like, oh man, I got goosebumps listening to this guy cry. I'm gonna make music out of this, and it exploded, right? So in the same way, we're trying to do the same thing, and I hope to get each and every one of you to start to promote goodness on the internet, goodness of humanity on YouTube. And this is our best ploy at this point. And Me at the Zoo actually came out, uh, premiered in the Sundance Film Festival, 
And uh, immediately when it premiered on the big screen, my website was hacked and taken down. Gone. And I had to rebuild it very fast because uh, I wanted to catch those people that were coming because this was my slip in. This was my way because my whole website's telling you about trauma based mind control and all of the programming triggers. Anna Nicole Brittany and Mind Control was one of my DVDs and talks here at Brave New Books. And they didn't want you to know this. That's my belief. It's conspiracy. I don't know. But I know my website was hacked and taken down the day that me at the, at the zoo premiered. And it's, it's been picked up by HBO, so now everybody's going to be seeing this. And they're going to come to this awakening. And then I have one other film, which was sponsored and paid for by Disney star Dan Fogler. Uh, you might remember him from such films as Balls of Fury, or maybe you saw Mars Needs Moms. Well, here we were talking with Dan Fogler. I'm in a movie with him called Don Peyote, and we start talking about Disney programming, and we're like, yeah, well, you know, Disney always kills the mother, right? And this is part of the sociological programming that they use. And he says, yeah, well, I'm in a movie called Mars Needs Moms. Uh, <laughs> because they killed all the moms, right? Uh, so he, it blew his mind. He's like, should I quit Disney? Should I quit? And I'm like, no, I'll take Disney's money and make yourself a movie. So he did. And he uh, made his 2012 breakout, Don Peyote, which is all about awakening to the New World Order, how much trouble this causes in relationships when one partner awakens and the other doesn't. And he does it in the most funny, hilarious, Dan Fogler way. And so that'll be coming out in April. So these were my attempts to try and to get into the mainstream, to try and discuss and talk to the public. And this is what I hope all of you will do, is just get out there and get on the friendship agenda. Thank you all. Thank you all. And I can't believe you all showed up. This is... <laughs> it might be there. I'll be in my big yellow school bus heading to Hollywood at that moment. <laughs> well, like I say, the only thing I can think to do is to, to break the, the idea that we are these evil beings. We have to start to promote ourselves emotionally, you see. Emotions are something that they are very against and very programming into the transhumanist agenda was that emotions need to be eradicated. They're coming up with pills and other mental uh, projections that can shut down your emotions. You know, it'll help you quit smoking, right? Uh, so emotions are the key, and if we start broadcasting our emotions out to the world, even if it's not on YouTube, even if it's just like at a grocery store, giving a smile to someone, we've got to build up the friendship agenda. We've got to start to show our, our true nature. Yes? Um, one of my personal um, kind of messages for that, that I got about all this, you're absolutely right. But, um, also, every choice that we make, we have to realize we are making a choice towards life or towards death, because these are death calls. Right. And we want to make the choice towards life, so we want to have integrity in our choices and really think about what we are giving our power to, because each one of us has tremendous power. I don't know if there's any way for us to... You know, we don't have the machinery to see what happens when we put goodness out there on the other side. Right. But I'm pretty sure that we've slowed them down for years because of the goodness. Absolutely. I was in Washington, D.C. in 1993 with a group of rainbow gathering people, so the original Occupy, if you will, sitting out in front of Bill Clinton's White House for nine days. And at that very time, as we had all gathered in peace in front of the White House, they were doing a study on prayer and whether or not it would affect the... And it was right when we were there. So we were compounding that whole thing. And, and so that's probably why they got such high uh, or such low uh, crime rates from during that prayer. Uh, we were there as well, and we didn't even know that this was going on. So yeah, absolutely. We have so much more power than they tell us. And they want to keep us boxed in and believing. I mean, you know, you got your bitten apple here. Uh, this is actually the bitten apple of, uh, of Snow White, and it's poison and puts you to sleep. And that's where he came up with the logo. It's in Steve Jobs' own biography. So, um, you know, that's that's the whole thing. We've got to get back to human to human to contact, and, and we've got to break out from this whole programming. <laughs> yes. I had a question about CERN. All right. Are you familiar with the connections between CERN and the god Apollo? at all? Apollo? Just, no. For instance, like, uh, I was wondering maybe you could tell me, but maybe not. Uh, CERN or CERNUNOS, the long form, 
is a Celtic god associated with Apollo. The French town that CERN is located in is named after Apollo, it had a temple to Apollo during Roman times. And then there's a statue of Shiva, the destroyer god, mm -hmm. outside CERN. And, mm -hmm. Well, some people connected this to Revelation 9-11, the angel from the abyss named Apollyon, right. the destroyer. Can you, do you have anything to add to that? Any, you know? I, I, I don't. Um, although I did look into a lot of that, and of course the Apollyon connection and... And, um, and the Higgs, the god particle, right? The yeah. Or god or... What was I going to say to that, though? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I did have something there, but honestly. Yes? If, if one time they were working on building a, a fusion reactor at, at Marseille, or near Marseille, and I don't know how far that is away from CERN, I've always wondered if that project was still going on, and, and something happened in that collider, what it might do to that other uh, project. Right. There was a lot of interesting things when they sure turned on CERN. Actually, the, the Norway spiral, uh, CERN was at full power for the first time when that happened. Um, and they said they were going to be punching holes into the other dimension and that it might cause strangelets and rogue black holes and all of these uh, critical problems. Um, and of course, there was a time traveling owl that shut down the whole system when it dropped a baguette on the wiring. I don't know if you caught that. Uh, yeah, CERN. I, I have a whole uh, CERN news section on my website. Uh, so anything you want to go back and look up, you know, it's all there. Didn't they have like a massive explosion when they turned the thing on full power? Like they had a couple of failure and there was this explosion in one of a certain portion of CERN? I don't know. The only thing I remember is the time traveling owl dropping the baguette. I can't remember any other major shutdowns. Before it ever went online, it was severely damaged and had to be completely re redone. Okay. Yeah, I, I probably have that backed up somewhere. Because, yeah, I mean, I started talking about CERN when I was on Access way back with William Henry. And, uh, you know, they didn't even have the LHC grid then yet or anything. Um, I studied genetics at the same place where I studied past history, UT, so I might be wrong on this. Um, your genetics um, thing with uh, Barack Obama, we were studying Dolly the sheep at that time, and Dolly was getting osteoporosis, right. old age diseases, and the explanation was that Dolly was receiving chromosomes from a sheep that was aged, and hence the chromosomes were turning on old age problems, and Dolly was getting old age problems at a very young age. Right. Wouldn't Barack Obama, if he got genetic material from someone from Egypt that was old, wouldn't he be having these old age problems? Yeah, it's hard to say. You you know, know, articles, my man, have you not seen articles that specifically show like the grain of his hair? I'm not afraid of age. He has aged quite a bit. It's interesting because the office of the president seems that like everyone they are always front certificates. They do, they do. They like die immediately. But yeah, you know, and the problem being that that the guys uh Ian Wilmot and uh out there at Roslyn uh didn't even bother to, to know what sheep they had gotten the cells from, you know, so we don't even have a, a, a knowledge of where the, the, you know, the cells came from because they, they didn't even expect to be famous, right? They were just sitting there in their little ranch in Roslyn, which of course Roslyn Chapel plays into this whole story too. And, uh, yeah, they, you know, they didn't keep any records of, as to what, you know, where the sheep came from or anything. They, do you have any thoughts no. on? Oh, no. Sorry. Go ahead. Do you have any thoughts on uh, the upcoming 2012 Olympics or prognostication, possibly? Because I mean, I'm sure you know the logo looks like Zion. Yeah, yeah, the Zion, and then of course the alien uh, icons that they have. Um, oh man, I got their name right there in the back of my head: Midoran and whatever the one alien eye, one-eyed aliens that they have. Of course, the single eye plays into the story a lot too. I was doing a just a crude, it just occurred to me one day to look into that a little bit. And uh, you know, I'm sure it means nothing, but you know, it's the 30th winter Olympiad, so XXX and the Roman numerals. And then I started thinking to myself, I'm trying to find connections. And I thought, okay, 2012. And so I'm like, all right, well, how can I bring that together? I just thought lines of latitude and longitude. I'm sure it means nothing, but I happen to plug in uh, 30 degrees latitude, 12 and longitude, and it happens to be in Libya. So I thought that was an interesting, you know, thing. Again, probably means nothing, but again, with the war that just happened and 
I, it seems to me I know the architecture and then the city uh, layout of, of London, obviously the city of London. So I know in 1984 they had this giant flying saucer hanging out over the, the Olympics. And, uh, you know, it might be a really good time for that type of programming for the alien arrival uh, for the 2012 Olympics. It seems like a culmination of something will happen to me. Yeah. I don't know. For 2012, I'm like, okay, nothing's real. Nothing is real. There's no such thing as a presidential election. There's no such thing as legislation, government, religion, or any of it. Money, it's all a thought. Yeah. Let's just let it all go for 2012, all right? Forget it all. Forget it all. So that we can get down to the real brass tacks and just start chatting. Uh, and I gotta use the restroom. <laughs> I haven't looked at that card. I was just looking at the Lady Gaga card recently. Uh, you know, where the weird goes pro. Um, but. <laughs> Thanks, Raymond. Good job. solution before long. How long have we been talking? An hour? Or just an hour? Okay. So, I want to get through this portion of this pretty quickly. I could probably just uh, give you this last little point. And of course, you know, Disney's logo is also 666. The lottery, yes, with the 666. Sure. Uh, and then the words that you can make from 666, because in, in Hebrew, 6 is V, but in English, 6 is F. So F, F, F. Okay, we're not filling. Go ahead. All right. Three minutes? Yeah. You got two minutes. Two okay. minutes on the tape. All right. Well, let's go ahead and swap the tape. My name's Harlan. I'm the owner of Raven Books. I've been here for uh, five and a half years now. Yeah. What's that? Okay. Where's the beard? Uh, right, where'd the beard go? It's been three years. I know you got to keep them guessing sometimes, you know? 
Well, um, I guess it was five and a half years ago that uh, we opened this place up and there, there was a tall, skinny guy that came in uh, probably two or three days after we opened. And uh, we were all sitting around talking and I, I noticed he was, uh, somebody was talking about religious things and, and I, I heard this gentleman say, well, we all know that Jesus was an alien, right? <laughs> and I thought, I have to talk to this guy. And lo and behold, it was Freeman who came in, introduced himself, and I think we did an event uh, a couple weeks after the store opened. And so uh, he, he, Freeman is a true friend of the bookstore, has been here literally since day one or day two, and uh, we're, we're so glad to have him back, and it's so glad to have all his friends back. It's so good to see so many people that I haven't seen in such a long time. So uh, please keep coming back. We'll have lots of good stuff in store, but nothing quite like tonight. Uh, Freeman is a renowned researcher and investigatory writer on, uh, on many topics, including uh, the occult and uh, conspiracies in general. And I think you're all gonna be walk away uh, very satisfied that you heard something you probably never thought of or ever heard before. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm <coughs> changing the list, <laughs> jumping back, going back. So I, let's go ahead and just let this. So now the Secret Service gave the, uh, the Obamas uh, code names. And these code names actually fit perfectly with Akhenaten and his family. Now I want you to know that I did not manipulate this photograph at all. I took the Time cover magazine of Barack Obama and I put it with Akhenaten's bust. I took the bust of Queen T and, uh, and that's Michelle Obama's high school photo. I took a bust of Marita Ten and that is Malaya. Now you'll see that each of the code names that they are given actually fit the whole story as well. Renegade, Renaissance, Radiance, and Rosebud are the names of the family. Now first of all, if we're going to call our president Renegade, this is what it means. Someone who rebels and becomes an outlaw. A disloyal person who betrays and deserts his cause or religion or the political party or friends, etc. So this is the title they've given to Barack Obama in the Secret Service. Now, you might wonder, can they actually clone a mummy? And in 1984, sorry, my screen, I can't see. 1984, they came out, a New York Times article, showing that intact genetic material was taken from a mummy and cloned. Now this is not to say they rebuilt the mummy, or brought the mummy back to life. They cloned cells. But the, the important part of the story was that mummification, a, a process that we still know nothing about, Lenin, Stalin are rotting in their mummy wraps. We don't know how to mummy like the Egyptians did. And mummification saves a viable cell for human cloning. These guys can come. sixth or seventh presentation here at the bookstore. Most of these lectures have gone viral. Uh, I put them out on freemantv.com if you want to catch up on any thought I've ever had. Uh, it's all there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so the last time I was here we spoke on Obama cloning and becoming space war. And I blew a few minds with this talk. But you know what? I didn't honestly have all the evidence necessary to really say what I meant to say. Now I do. 
right. The story has not stopped, <laughs> as many of my stories do. Uh, they carry forward and continue to amaze even me. So let's open, because this talk is uh, basically based on ET and the transhumanist <coughs> agenda. And it's going to get into social programming, uh, cloning, and uh, some stuff that you're going to find just totally bizarre. But I wanted to open this uh, with a little word from our former master, uh, Bill Clinton. Oh. There is much about cloning that we still do not know. But this much we do. Any discovery that touches upon human creation is not simply a matter of scientific inquiry. It is a matter of morality and spirituality as well. I believe we must respect this profound gift and resist the temptation to replicate ourselves. Shortly after Dolly's birth was announced, President Clinton took steps towards banning human cloning experiments in the United States. The bioethics general is that it requires an electrical shock to the cell to, to make it alive. So now we got this question, is it actually alive? What, what is that life force, that life spark that was given to this cell to make it grow? Uh, and as they said, many people are going on and uh, continuing with human cloning behind the scenes, such as Dr. Zavos, who actually spoke before Congress about cloning humans with another strange character known as Ra'el. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ra'el, but he's been an object of my talks for a long time. Now, this is a guy who claimed to meet Yahweh in a flying saucer. And he told him to begin these cloning techniques in a new embassy in Israel for the Elohim's return, which of course has a flying saucer-shaped swimming pool, I don't know. But the symbol that uh, Ra'el wore to Congress and wants to put on this temple to the extraterrestrial gods in Israel is the Star of David interwoven with a swastika. And of course, this caused a lot of strife. Uh, but Dr. Zavos showed up with Ra'el to, to say that human cloning was not going to go away, and I wasn't going to show this. In the eerie blue gonna, light of his secret world. lab, one of the world's most controversial scientists shows off his creation, cloned human embryos that are genetic carbon copies of their father. Oh, my babies are doing well. They look beautiful. Filmed for a TV documentary, Dr. Paniotis Zavos implants 11 of the embryos in four women, one of them British, in the hope of producing the first cloned human being. Now, the reason he can get away with this is that he is working in Saudi Arabia, where the uh, cloning is not, uh, the legislation on cloning is not as stringent, and he can get away with cloning humans at this point. So, as I came before you before, uh, we were talking about Obama cloning in the coming space war. I wonder how many of you were here? Just a few. Okay, so let's review. Uh, now, I had brought this topic up in, in the hopes that it would gain some more national attention Thanks to a uh, commission he established called upon Rabbi Dorf, along with several other members of the religious and scientific community, to address the ethics of human cloning. The commission recommended that cloning be banned, at least temporarily, um, while further study is, uh, is done as to exactly what it would involve and what the risks are. Eight years to other world leaders took similar action. The reaction against the prospect of cloning the human and spirit worldwide on this Sunday address that they applied such experiments were dangerous. Today, it's been banned cloning experiments. So did Argentina. And the German government said there should be a worldwide ban on cloning. I don't think government bans will indeed stop it. First of all, because you'd have to have an international ban on cloning in order to do that. And even if you had an international ban, there's no guarantee whatsoever that it won't happen in some lab somewhere. Technology, once it's developed, does not go away. It may go underground if sufficiently persecuted. Uh, human cloning is not going away. And already we have many legislative uh, bodies coming together discussing the human cloning problem. Now, of course, as they were saying, and there's a lot of reasons that human cloning could be a huge problem, in that we could start generating humans for certain jobs or certain work. And uh, 
the whole idea of the the need of life, <laughs> you know, and, and the, the sanctity of, of human life. You're not supposed to be watching all this behind the camera here, but uh, <laughs> not so the thing. All right, <laughs> the uh, the sanctity of human life it comes a full board in question if we start talking about cloning humans and then what's going to happen with those cloned humans. Are they citizens? Are they people? Uh, the, the, the methods of human cloning have been around since Dolly was created and the first clone to be cloned was actually split by a baby hair. Uh, this is how the techniques came about as they cloned frogs and other amphibians. They would use, a, well, the first doctor to do this actually used a baby hair off his baby's head and, and split the cell. But the curious thing about human cloning or cloning in uh, the fact that Barack Obama came out discussing human cloning. Uh, but no one seemed to notice. It is in my new film, E.T. and the Transhumanist Agenda. I do have uh, Barack Obama's speech on human cloning and how he found it profoundly wrong and dangerous, as many should. But perhaps he might just be a clone himself. Now, as strange as this may seem to you, this is a singular Egyptian family. It is the family of Akhenaten. This is Akhenaten who turned Egypt on its head, turned, uh, took the capital of Egypt, put it in Thebes, took it from Thebes and moved it to his own capital in Armana, got rid of the, mono, or the, the many gods and brought the first monotheistic religion, the worship of the Aten. And so he was known as the renegade pharaoh because he was then placed, uh, he, he turned Egypt on its head. But now the, the free Masonic orders, the, the secret societies, revere this man. They, they call him the first individual. They call him the first Democrat. And it's because Akhenaten seemed to be a very real pharaoh, one that, that showed himself, depicted himself with his family, with everyone else, and, and brought about the most realistic artwork Egypt had ever known. But he was pretty much overshadowed by his mother which was Queen T. And she had ruled since uh, being four years old, actually, and through a couple of pharaohs, uh, her husband, and then uh, the child of Akhenaten, finally followed by King Tut, uh, she basically had all the power. The, the pharaohs themselves were too young, Queen T ran the show. Akhenaten produced two children with Nefertiti, his wife. And the two children, <laughs> are actually identical to Malaya and Sasha. So I had put together the idea that it's quite possible, I keep trying to use the scroll button, uh, it's quite possible that these people actually are clones of these ancient pharaohs.